from New York. Ebro in the morning. On Hot 97. It's Ebro in the morning. Laura <laughs> Styles, Rosenberg, and DJ Misbehavior? Yeah. Give it up. Why the Give question? I'm sure it's her. Well, you're a DJ. Yes. How, for how long? Um, officially 89 I started taking it seriously like this is something I could do and be in clubs and clubs yes there were only clubs then well, I saw a viral video of you ripping a party down yeah and that was like a week or two ago right and this oh, two weeks ago yeah and where yeah. was this party this was um, uh, the Museum of the City of New York and they do a party called Uptown Bounce uh, four Wednesdays in the summer and Mobile Mondays, one of the crews that I play with. Um, shout to Ems. Shout to Ems. We, Joey Carvello yes, still involved hello. in that too? Yep, Joey Carvello, Just Blaze, Natasha Diggs, Money Mikes, Operator Ems, Me, Misbehavior, and then we have guests. And So we get bookings all around the summer, so we hook that up and someone was just filming me. Well, I'm, I'm stereotyping here because obviously you don't look no, I know. like a DJ, which <laughs> right. is why I said DJ misbehavior because yeah. I think that's part of why the video went viral yeah. because it was like, who's this lady? Yeah. She's a DJ? And or, she's have killing you got, it. Have you got, and she's ripping it. On a regular yeah. basis, though, do you get that or no? I mean, yes, I get it all the time. You still get you yeah. st Really? So yeah. people will come up to you and be like, uh, what do they say? Well, they just say you don't look like a DJ. I, th I think also it depends. Partly it was that and also the music I was playing because the theme was 90s. And I was playing with Joey and Joey, that hip hop's not his lane at all. So I knew where I would be going on that day. And people were already asking, is someone going to play hip hop? And I was kind of like, well, I started in 89 and all I played in the clubs in 89 was hip hop and R&B. So I was kind of like, it was a no brainer. It, what, was it, it wasn't... Like, I know those songs. You was know it a I mean? novelty when in 1989, 90, 91, when you were new? Um, was it, were people surprised then also? Uh, yeah, because there were hardly any. It, it was a novelty to be to, more to be female rather than to be white, because those are the two things that people kind of, you know, the stereotypical side of it. So, I mean, I think there was probably only about six female DJs in London total. So how did you I, how did you get your start? Um, I was just doing things for friends, you know, because I always liked music and I had records and, you know, I did a friend's wedding and just fun like that. And then one day I, I was living in a place called Brighton, which is outside London, and it was very rave scene. And I had sort of just one record box at this point with like soul and funk in it. And I saw a little ad that said you know we do this party and it's all soul and funk so i just went down there and said i dj can i dj and the dj partner at the time the, the resident guy there was really cool like not all guys were cool then you know but he was really he embraced it he helped me and that's pretty much what i was doing soul and funk and i walked in and he played uh gangstar words i manifest and epmd the big payback and i was suddenly like whoa because the, the funk, you know, I, the, mm. the relationship. So I was straight in, okay, I'm buying those records too. And it kind of started from there. Really. So at that point, you were more just into soul and funk and that got you into hip hop. Yes. Was hearing records because like hearing that. those two records, all, all records like that. Yeah. And wow, then okay. once that started and you go to the record stores. Yeah, and then the record stores, everything was slower. You know, you'd go and you'd see a lot of the same records on the wall every week and you'd spot a new one. And, oh, what's that? It wasn't now like you got like... 2000 mp3s coming at you it's a bit more smaller group of people making music so that's an interesting point that no one really talks about that often is how when you went to a regular dj store whether it was beat street in new york or a store my, the store i went to 12 inch in dc or, or leopold or wherever yeah. the Amiibo. wall of 12 inches you're right. It would it stay. Ba out, it, ch it changed very gradually. Yes. Like well, over and if a it year. was a store you went to frequently, yes. obviously you walked in and they're like, "Yo, here's the new heat. You got yeah. it." And yeah. you're like, "Boom, give yeah. me that. Let's ride." It was like they knew the DJs. They knew who was yeah. coming in. You went yeah. to the same places and got your vinyl. So yeah. how how long? Like how how long was it before you got very serious about the DJing? And then how far did you go in you? 
How far did you go in the UK as far as like how big did you get as a um, DJ? Well, pretty big. I mean, we were doing this party, me and the partner at the time. And then um, I decided to move up to London because Brighton just didn't have enough of that kind of music. It was very rave. Techno. When you say rave, you're talking like dance, electronic yeah, like, yeah. stuff. No, kind of what EDM. I mean, sort of techno, jungle, kind of. But but these huge parties with thousands of people all doing ex, ex you know, that kind of yeah. vibe. And very small market, and you couldn't. Re there wasn't really much on the radio, so you'd have to get people to tape shows like Tim Westwood or whatever, and and literally post them to you or you I'd, I'd go up to London and buy records so I decided to move to London because it wasn't the market wasn't big enough and I was doing something just opening for someone in a at a party and a guy called Brian Norman started a night called Fresh and Funky which I know a lot of hip-hop heads from here it was the biggest Wednesday night party for for that kind of music in the history of London I mean 700 people a week would mm -hmm. go there and pretty much everyone who came from the States who were visiting, if they were there on a Wednesday night, that's where they went. So he gave me, like, they didn't have an opener, so he said, could you open this week? And I said, yeah, sure. And then it just, they were like, oh, we love you, just be the opener. And because the party was so hard to get into, there was already people lining up when I'd get there. So it wasn't like you were doing the opener and there was nobody in there. It was like they were ready to come in as I was walking in. So I got this... And then they were kind of like, you know, you can't really play any big hits because we need to play them later. So I started listening to the albums and thinking, oh, I like that cut. And sometimes that would be the next single. So it kind of made me even ahead of them. <laughs> right, right. In a kind of, you right, know, because right, right. it's suddenly like, oh, she's been, she's been rocking that for like months. And now then it's... The same then it's so, um, so it kind of grew from there. And then I got other gigs from that. And um, But I, always, I listened to so much... Hip hop that I was kind of like I want to I want to know what the city, especially East Coast. I was drawn a lot to the East Coast, so I wanted to see what you know. You'd hear names of streets and references, so I came out for the New Music Seminar in '94, which I think might have been the last one. Um, and I volunteered for two weeks in a, one of the offices and got my badge and went to all the shows and everything. Probably one of the best shows I went to was. Fuji's, Keras One, Das FX, PMD, and Scratch in some teeny, teeny club. And uh, Keras was headlining. Um, so I just got kind of hooked and I wanted to come back. It took me about five years to do that. Um, and I never really intended to stay this long. It's just New York really so sucks you, came you back, in. You came back in like 99 and never left. Yeah. I didn't think I was going to do that. But, you know, you, you, you spend a year and then maybe a little something else is just over the horizon. You say another year and another year. Right. Before you know it, you kind of look back. A New Yorker. At, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you, um, I mean, you're not, you're not out here doing DJ scratch competitions. No, you're just rocking no, parties. I you never, know when to yeah. get in and out of records and which records to pick. I like rocking parties. And I've never said, you know, if you start saying I'm a hip hop DJ, then you, you have to have those elements. Right. And I'm not, expected I'm, to cut and scratch. I, I rock parties. I've always started in the club scene in front of, even when I had no skills, I was playing in a club in front of people with a dance floor and I couldn't mix or anything. But. That was, there weren't lounges then. I mean, if you were going to DJ, you're either on the radio in some way or you're in a club. There wasn't really any other kind of outlets. So I kind of learned, I was for, I learned to mix because the dance floor was going to be better if I did it. Yeah. Not, that was the drive, I think. And I've always just been, I mean, I love playing all kind of music. So to me, it's just being a, a good party rocking person. So, and, you know. If we're going to have, we're, if you don't mind, we're going to, Show you the DJ booth here at Hot 97. Have okay, you jump cool. on and play some records, cool. have some fun. What would you say, though, if someone said, we need misbehavior to DJ, and you could do whatever you want, it's open format, just give us your best, you know, 20, 30-minute set. What kind of stuff are you playing? Like, what's your bread and butter, that stuff in your bag that you always go back always, to? Always. Uh, I think it's where where I go back to is, is I mean, I love reggae, too. Um you know, most people in England, we, we you know, we have a heavy reggae influence. So I love reggae. So I'd always have reggae. I'd always have the 90s hip hop classics because that's where I kind of started. Um, and again, like soul funk. But, I, you know, I think it would be a bit of everything um, because I, when I came here, I started playing in a roller skate, the roller skating party in Central Park. 
and I had to get my house game up because there's a lot of house heads in there. And if you want to, if you want to, if you're and you have a day to yourself, it's not like you play with other people. So you take the whole day. So for me, I had to get that game up because again, it's about the people in front of you. So again, I like that. I think you know it would. I like to bring a little bit of everything to play to people who are open to everything, as long as it's good music. And when That's you play, do you still just play vinyl? Uh, or not all you, the time. Okay, no. okay. So you go back and forth with yeah. Serato. I like the. I mean, sometimes when I get a Serato gig, I'm like, yay. Oh, because you don't have to carry on with that. <laughs> well, also because you hear a song you like, you can have it in 10 seconds. Right. Like, right. You, you, can't, you, you think of someone, go... you think of something right then, you're like, ooh, you know what yeah. would work? Oh, I don't have it. Let me just go to the iTunes store, buy exactly. it, and now I play it. Right. Whereas records, you've got to be, let me call everyone. Or <laughs> right. <laughs> like, we know a lot of DJs, right. all of us in this room. I would say so. We yeah. know a lot of DJs. Oh, we okay. know a lot of white DJs. Yes. Yeah. And we know a lot of female DJs. Yeah. Misbehavior, DJ Misbehavior's here today because Rosenberg was like, yo, we should have her up. And so I want to talk to you for a minute. This might be uncomfortable for you. No, no. Why did you want to have her up? Um, well, I ran into Ems, who's a DJ who's one of the guys behind Mobile Mondays. And mm -hmm. he was like, hey, do you know Misbehavior? And I was like, oh, I know her name and I know she's supposed to be dope, but I, no, I don't really know her personally. Mm -hmm. So he was like, I think you'd think that her story's interesting. Okay. So I was like, all right, cool. And I, I mean, full disclosure, M's is my man. So when he said it, I was like, I'm, like I'm open to having people up if someone who I so respect. So you didn't just have her up because she's a white lady who DJs. No, but although I think he, I think everyone knows that's part of the story that makes it interesting. Although truth be told, and then and then secondarily, when I came in and brought it up, everyone's like, "Oh, she just had the viral video last week." Because Cash like, oh. One had brought in, he's like, "Laura, check this out. You're gonna love this." So he's showing me the video. I'm like, "Yo, she's killing it!" And then we were all like looking at it in the studio. But I'll tell you the truth about it. I don't know if this is where you're going or not. And I think this is probably the part that's uncomfortable. If there's anything that's uncomfortable, is that honestly being a white DJ is not that interesting anymore, and being a female DJ is not that interesting anymore. Um, however. Being a, a a female DJ of your age range yeah. is what makes it interesting. And that's the part that I wonder if it gets annoying because think about how many male counterparts you have that are in your age range that Still no rocking. one says boo right. about them DJing. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and they're true. wearing size 44 jeans in the club. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and no one says anything. And I don't know exactly how old you are, but guessing that that is part of the novelty of when people are like, that was the novelty of that video. It was well, like, who's yeah. this lady? Well, yeah. it wasn't Not even who's that. this kid, DJ. Yeah, no. yeah, who's yeah. this lady? <laughs> yeah, but it, and it wasn't even that. It was like, who's the teacher? Right, 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 right. Who's the teacher DJing and ripping it to shreds? That's what I saw. I was uh, like, yo, so they you. got a teacher at this? Because I thought it was a school. <laughs> I thought it was like a school lunchtime. I was like, yo, they got a teacher body in it like that? I used right. to teach those. So, so there you go. <laughs> so there you go. But I, that's what I wanted. Because I'm sitting here in this interview and I, and look. 1989, right? I grew, I mean, I was on the radio in 1990. There were tons of white people, women, everybody who loved hip-hop. I'm from Northern California. Right. It's complete. If you've ever been to Northern California, been to any hip-hop party in Northern California, there's loads of everyone. Asian, Mexican, yes. black, yeah. white. So yeah. it's not that uncommon. So I'm sitting yeah. here listening to the interview, and I'm like, we're lying. The reason misbehavior is up here is because she is a... Uh, she looks like she might be a librarian, and she <laughs> rips <laughs> parties to shreds. Yeah, that's that's why she's here. Like, you know what does I mean? It, does it annoy you though at all that you like? If you were a man, you get a lot less of like, oh, about like that stuff, or no? I mean, I think it can go either way. I think the thing is, I know I don't look the part, but I didn't come. I'm. I guess I'm not trying to look something. I'm yeah, just you're just trying to be. Me. You're just yourself. Um, and, and I think it, that's also why it's so cool. Right. It's right. cool, and as we all know from coming up in hip-hop, the things that have become beloved in hip-hop, and I think this is also not discussed, are the things that don't fit quite right into a stereotype. Because yeah. there's tons of hip-hop that comes in whatever form it comes, whether it's a graffiti artist, and you're like, yo, you do graffiti? Right? You know what yeah. I mean? And you would think they're a certain type. Or yeah. someone who's got bars, and you're like, you got bars? Like, it's unexpected, and I think... That's one of the beauties of hip hop is you don't have to. But fit. DJ, the yeah. DJs themselves, though, I'm guessing, never say boo about it. Like I think DJ, I feel like real DJs, our whole lives, we expect that everyone around in a DJ circle can be totally different. Right, right. Is that yeah. is that I generally so. your experience? Yeah, I think so. I think um, 
And I guess years ago, it was less, everything was less visual as well. And English people are quite scruffy. I mean, we kind of, DJs would roll up to the club like they just got out of bed. <laughs> right, right, right. Now but we're I used all to be American DJs world. too. Yeah, we're yeah. all in this world now. When Flex used to of... show up to the tunnel, woo, <laughs> <laughs> like a disaster. Can you, talk about, you mentioned earlier that not all DJs were as nice, right? right. And I know that people be, are still to this day are very critical with female DJs. I know right. my girlfriends that are female DJs are very critical of other female DJs because yeah. they were like, okay, yeah, she's cute, whatever, but can she scratch? Can she mix? Right, yeah. can she, How are her transitions? Yeah. Extremely critical, more than other men. So talk about, you know, how people embraced you at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, it go, I mean, some guys were like, it's no place for a woman, you shouldn't be in the DJ booth. There was, you know, there was very much that. A couple of times not wanting to DJ with me, um... But then, the, you know, there's always those sides, the sides where it makes the struggle a little harder. But then there's often if there's four DJs in a room and you play and you're the only woman, they remember you. So someone right. looks at, you know, it could be like, well, the, that dude was playing, but it was like, oh, that woman was playing and there weren't many. So it sort of swings around. There's an about. advantage to it also. Yeah. But I am very critical of of women who just have a look. And then say, oh, well, I'm a DJ. And like then, those models and then, and, who just are right. the IG yeah. models who's going to party or whatever. Well, and they the, get paid, you know, they're taking yeah. <laughs> That's taking the hard all, part. Okay. That must yeah. be the hard part because there are, of course, there are women out there who are amazing DJs. Yes, and I, I know and have seen lots. However, there are women who are very pretty, didn't have another gimmick, and someone was like, you know, I could just give you Serato and you could get yeah, bookings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that yeah. has to be irritating yeah, also, it is. especially when yeah. you've been lugging a yeah. records for yeah. 30 years. Yeah. But that also speaks to there is a, um, a large segment of popular people who don't know what a good fucking party is. Let's yes. just, you're right. Let's you're right. be, that's mm -hmm. the issue. And so they get someone who has a large following who doesn't know how to DJ. But it doesn't matter. Yes. People are stupid That's enough to true. show up to a party with a popular person and be like, are you going to so-and-so's party? And you're like, no. I mean, me, oftentimes. I'm like, no, why? Mm -mm. Why would I go to their party? And I, But a lot of people do for their Instagram or to say they were at a place and the DJ is trash. Yeah. And most of those people, just because they're hanging around having a conversation with popular people, they think they went to a great event. Yeah. Or those of us who have been to great events where you're socializing and the music is curated amazingly. You know the difference. And I think yeah. that's a something that's missing at a lot of events is this yeah. people are put on to use their popularity to promote, not because they're going to put together a great event. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think that's, it's sad, actually. It happens a lot in fashion, I think, because yes. I, I did an event, quite a big event, but I was in the smaller room and the main room, the DJ um, I mean, there was like 500 people in there. And when I'd gone on her site just to check out, it was really about her backstage at a fashion show. But on the other hand, if the client is something like Chanel and you're you're always at the fashion shows and you're rocking Chanel, like you say, that no, the audience don't really know any different. They're getting yeah. free drinks and... and and you I just play the see, records that are popular. They don't yeah, have to be even put together. Exactly. Well. I can see sometimes why they would go down that lane because that person's like down with their brand, I guess. What you do you think? So. What do you think's the best DJ city that you've been to in the world? London. Really? Yeah. You think London yeah. London DJs are the best? Yeah. What makes them What makes them good? Because I think whatever age they are, they always find that what the history is really important. So if you go to certain things in London, like say particularly reggae, because I love dub and I love roots and a lot of that stuff is very hard to play that here. But in England, there's so much of a new element of people who get into, and Japan's like that too. They very much want to learn about where did this come from. I'm not saying there aren't people here, but no, it's, there's America's a lot, but quite it's... a disposable society, isn't Talk it? About What's it. hot? What's right? Talk about, look, it's if so you don't true. want to say it because you got an accent, and you think, let me say it. <laughs> America's trash. We're fast food <laughs> and we don't appreciate culture. Let's keep it 100. Right. There's a large segment of our population here in America that doesn't appreciate the history of things yeah. and doesn't appreciate the value of culture. Right, where yeah. if you go to London, if you've been, you can tell that they've and Japan, yeah, bruh, yeah, you have to know history in Japan, you have to know culture in Japan. No, there's have a to. serious appreciation, and there's a huge respect for people who do. And I, I would go as far as saying, like, I really think that in a lot of ways, New York's as bad as it gets in, in terms of the DJs who are popping, 
their respect for the craft is so low. Like when I got here, when I first moved here, I remember being amazed at how few people blend, right? Like you're always yeah, like, yeah, yeah. transitions here are yelling. For the most part, a lot of main, mainstream clubs, obviously you guys do parties that are for, I mean, real music nerds who like wanna go out and party and hear a real party, like really see people DJ. But for the mainstream club, transitions here are yelling. And like, even if you go to the West Coast, even a commercial party where they're playing commercial regular shit, you will hear cutting and blending in a club. But like, it's weird there's... because we have like like DJ Camillo, right? Our, our very own DJ Camillo. He's learned to use like his yelling and his voice. He blends it all so good together that it doesn't bother you. But I also and think, like, he's uh, turned it how, into a tool. But it's how people party. You guys are talking about how people party, right? When you go to London, people are dancing. Yes. So they're dancing. Mm -hmm. Dancing. Very good mm -hmm. point. So, at the, so as <laughs> so a result a of that, York it's club, more important to, to blend sure records and, and create together. a vibe. Yes, yes. Whereas here, if what they're doing is standing next to a bottle, the relevance of yelling and giving shout outs, it, it means more. And, that's and the records doing. don't need to blend. Just throw on the po most popular records, get a response from the crowd, go to the next record. Like you take like a Mr. C and you put him in a strip club, he's going to DJ one way. You put him in a roller skating party. Right. It's yeah, another completely one. Different. Same with Flex, right? You put Flex blends if he wants to. We'll get to the house records. We'll get to the disco records. But you put him in, you know, some hood joint where people just want to hit a big record. Yeah. yeah. It's very true. You know, you got to know your audience as, you, as DJ Misbehavior <laughs> pointed out. But um, I think you make a point? good point about vibe because if people are dancing, there's an underlying rhythm that's consistent. You have to keep, right. Whereas when I first came here, I found a lot more DJs were more about you throw on that, whoa, the hit. Right. And then, whoa, here comes yeah. another one. Just and a it, reaction. It's almost like the way that we'd play reggae, but with every music. Every song, <laughs> right. It never well, stops. And, and, um, and to your point, a lot of what you have here in New York City came out of reggae culture, right? Yeah. From Cool Herc. Yes, Hollywood. Exactly. These are Actually, all guys that true. have yeah, West yeah, Indian yeah, roots yeah, yeah, that yeah. learn from the sound mm -hmm. system and the battles and those things. So that style is right. is more of that than the the Frankie Crocker disco blended all together. Yeah. You know. You can follow me on Instagram at DJ Misbehavior. Uh, you can follow us at Mobile Mondays. Um, uh, yeah, that's probably the easiest way to find me. All right. If well, you can spell it properly, that's how do you spell it. <laughs> M I S B E H A V I O U R. Oh, so any sheesh. any Caribbean people will will know because we spell color. You know the U with the O U R. The U. Uh -huh. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> well said. Let's go.